All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome. And uh, uh, I know some of you, uh, but uh, uh, some of whom I've even stood uh, next to in, in real time when people met face to face, I think in a former. But for those of you who don't know me, my name is Scott Massey. I'm the um, managing director for international markets for Pantheon. Um, and uh, Australia and New Zealand is where I've been spending a lot of my time. Uh, currently, I'm based in Tokyo. So uh, yeah, so when you come up, let me know and we'll grab some food. Um, I promise, like my only caveat is I'll take you to a seasonally appropriate place. Uh, so we're not eating ramen in 35 degree summer heat. Um, but yeah, nice to meet you. And, and it's a pleasure to be here um, at, at the event. And, and it's a pleasure to, to uh, introduce Murray. Um, so just briefly, uh, yeah, I work for Pantheon. Um, we, we run a couple hundred thousand Drupal sites. We've been around since 2011, providing you know, great performance and uh, dev workflows for, for primarily agencies. Um, and uh, you know, it's been fundamental that agencies and developers never have to pay to use our platform. Um, we offer command line tools and integration along with security and governance and things that universities and organizations uh, really value. So, um, so yeah, while I'm trapped in Tokyo, I'm always available to chat about that or our partner program or demo our stuff or you know, feel free to demo it yourself. Um, I definitely drink our Kool-Aid, but we can always have a frank discussion about where we fit in and where we don't in your agency's go-to-market or where we can help drive creativity and results for your org's web strategy. Um, so having spent the last decade running Drupal sites myself and helping customers launch and run them and basically thinking about Drupal every day for the past um, decade, uh, like let me just start by saying I'm super excited about uh, where Drupal is and uh, maybe more so than I've ever been. Um, I just helped uh, an agency in the NT launch a, a government. Drupal nine, and um, yeah, I'm I'm really optimistic. Like I feel like Drupal eight and nine have lifted. Like I feel the 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 mantle of like the major version upgrade lifting, and and I'm adapting to what a world looks like without that. And um, I think the confidence in in compo my confidence in Composer and sort of the maturing workflows has been um, really encouraging and. Uh, and the integration with JavaScript and decoupled and things that others have talked about is really sort of exploding in, a, in an exciting way. Um, and, you know, and then finally, just, just to say out loud, I think most importantly, Drupal, just Drupal core and contrib is really awesome by itself, you know, and it's, it's always good to remember that because I think we always sort of uh, gravitate towards new features and, and that kind of thing. But uh, even recently, just messing around with views and what it can do, uh, it reminds me of what an exciting, you know, and fun um, uh, experience it is to to work with Drupal. Um, and so, yeah, like any open source uh, intimate relationship, I've had my ups and downs. But uh, one thing that has never uh, wavered for me is my affection and hope and excitement for the Drupal community and um, the community that surrounds Drupal. And before my time in Tokyo, uh, I lived in San Francisco. And I know that open source is open sourcing the code base is kind of a business model, but it's not always a really successful one. Um, and supporting an open source, and that's largely because I think supporting an open source project is more than just contributing to the code base. It's about building a community that embraces it. And um, having run meetups and Drupal users groups in both um, Chicago and there's a special place in my heart for uh, the next speaker, Murray and guys like him and, and Vladimir and others who really create the fundamental initial awareness of what Drupal is all about in Sydney and kind of all over. So, um, so I'm excited to, to welcome Murray. And then um, secondly, he's talking about something that uh, is really uh, of interest to me and something that I've been following really closely for the last several years. Um, I think like Drupal, like uh, Dries said, Drupal is is a leader in the enterprise market for content management and and um, you know, but I think that uh, enterprise means different things to different people and it also is different uh, in each region uh, globally and in ANZ. And um, 
and I think that uh, the thing to consider is that like a lot of the problems that enterprise is trying to solve are really the same problems that SMB and smaller business are trying to solve. And so um, I think that there's a real opportunity for agencies to provide a partnership that combines both like the flexibility of Drupal and the creativity and thought leadership um, that's that's part of the agency uh, uh, bloodstream and uh, part of the agency's team's um, special secret, you know, secret ability. Um, and so I think there's opportunities to collaborate kind of like uh, Therese said, but also maybe um, specialize. Uh, and one of the things that I think is emerging as a real opportunity to specialize for agencies is in marketing tech and um, in integrations. And none of those is more talked about than personalization. Um, so with that, um, you know, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Murray, and I'm super interested to hear what he has to discuss uh, about personalizing your Drupal website. Thank you so much, uh, Scott, for that introduction. I, I'm really looking forward to taking you up on your invitation there to, to go out in Tokyo one night. So uh, thank you for that. Hey, welcome everyone to 13 Ways to Personalize Your Drupal Website. In this presentation today, um, I'd like to show you some practical steps you can take uh, to take your Drupal uh, website to the next level, uh, and that is to personalize and customize the content for anonymous users. Um, a little bit about how um, I got to be giving this presentation today. Um, you know, I've been working with Drupal for a long time, and I've really enjoyed the, the content modeling capabilities of Drupal. But uh, you know, content management systems, they're a solved problem. Um, and the next phase of the web is all about integrating uh, in with other systems. Uh, and that includes uh, you know, personalizing uh, content and basically you know, serving the best content you can for your users at, uh, at that particular time. Um, before I, I jump in and show you some of these practical techniques that we're able to use, I'd just like to outline a few rules of the game. These are some of the ideas that uh, you know we've been uh, keeping in mind as we've been uh, developing a lot of the, uh, the the components we'll be showing you today. You could summarize it as uh, "Don't be evil." Uh, that's one way to say it. But um, basically, uh, for what we're looking at today, we'll only be using first-party cookies. We're not going to be pulling in data from external systems which have been tracking a profile on you. So we're only going to be uh, looking at information you've gathered on your own website or indeed maybe in your CRM or uh, marketing system. Um, we're also taking a loosely coupled approach. Uh, and by that, I mean um, we are not buying into a monolithic stack of you know, someone else's one solution to fit them all. We really want to be able to knit together different services and different approaches to suit uh, your requirements and you know the tech stack that you're uh, attracted to. So by loosely coupling uh, things, we're able to achieve that. And of course, that allows us to use best of breed uh, services. So um, you know if you have a service that you want to use, you're able to to pull that in and integrate it uh, with your website. And we are taking a Drupal-centric approach. And you may think that's obvious, but I think when you look at the marketing technologies that are out there, a lot of them are storing content inside them and then targeting that content into the site, where the, the CMS is really just a, a dumb repository to, to show uh, that dynamic content. Uh, on the contrary here, we're taking a Drupal-centric approach and using the, the CMS capabilities of Drupal uh, to manage that content. Uh, personalization is difficult. Uh, there's just a lot of things you've got to manage in order to uh, you know, deliver a great um, solution. And I think when you look out on the web and you read about personalization, you'll find a lot of people talking about it, how great it is, how important it is. But there's very little practical information about how you can actually achieve that. And that's one of the things I want to address today. Um, but in order to do that, you do have to have a strategy as to how you're going to, to roll that out. And I really consider this a UX problem. It's not just about technology. It's also about the user experience. Now, at the start of any project, 
you're going to have a discovery phase and a design phase usually. And during this process, you'll be looking at um, the types of people using your site, the audiences, the personas, um, what goals they might have, and the journeys they'll undertake uh, to get there. And usually this would mean, you know, defining a structure and, and sort of directing you users to you know where you want them to go but with personalization this is uh you know magnified a whole lot more because you really have to think much more clearly about what those pathways are going to do uh, what they're going to be and how the users are going to progress along them you also need content as well so you need content to support the user as they're going through that journey so that may be some introductory uh content some more um informational things and then you know all the way through to the conversion process uh, at the end um, so you need that content there but you also need to have content that's kind of going to prompt the user and and guide them uh, so in the, the demo i'll be giving a bit later you'll see different promotion blocks that are being used to uh to sort of guide users uh, along the path so really yeah sorting out your content is a huge part of the, the problem as well uh, Drupal does offer a lot of um, great tools to provide the foundations to support a personalization uh, system. Um, you know, no doubt we're all familiar with all this Drupal-y goodness here. We've got our content types and taxonomy for providing the structure. We've got blocks and views for you know, presenting uh, that information back to the user. And it's, it's funny, in the, the two presentations I've seen today, people have commented on views. So uh, yeah still obviously a very important module. Um, we have JSON, JSON data from other services and, and JSON API uh, within Drupal. So this is uh, really a key part of the, the puzzle as well. We have metadata. It's one thing to have the structure inside Drupal, but being able to reflect that structure out in metadata is also important because it allows client side uh, logic to consume that and uh, basically start deriving some more information about the things the users are interested in. So for example, we have a, a, a demo um, page here about Harry Potter. And this is some of the metadata we have on that page. And you can see we're focusing in on things such as audiences and topics here. And these are a couple of the, the concepts or the categories that we'll be using to um, drive the personalization. You can see we also have a really strong concept of uh, subject identity here. We're, use, we're using identifiers rather than just strings or, or labels. Um, really having a clear idea of what you're talking about uh, and having a persistent identifier like this also allows us to aggregate across systems. So if you're trying to build systems across multiple sites to, to run personalization or other things across that, um, having sort of keys like this uh, is helpful. So yeah, this metadata is consumed by uh, client-side uh, logic, and we'll see how that's working a little bit later. During this presentation, I'm going to be talking about a few different uh, Drupal modules, and uh, all of these are, are contrib, and you'll be able to download them and uh, play with them as you will. Um, the first one I'd like to mention is Smart Content. Uh, this is a module by Elevated uh, Third. And smart content uh, basically allows you to do customization with blocks. So it is able to take uh, um, local storage or basically the state um, of that user, and it is able to do conditional logic based on that to display uh, different blocks. Uh, so that block is pulled in uh, asynchronously and, and plonked on the page depending on the conditional logic. So on the right-hand side there, you can see uh, a little snippet from uh, the block configuration. Uh, in this case, we're saying go into local storage, pull out the UTM source value that's there. And if that equals EDM, go display this block. So this is a really sort of flexible and straightforward way of pulling in um, uh, dynamic content that's personalized to what that user is doing. And if you're looking for a way to, to get up and running, I definitely recommend uh, taking a look at Smart content. I think it's a, a bit of a sleeper in the, the Drupal community, and um, it's certainly one of the, the main techniques I'll be using today. There is another module which is very uh, similar, um, operates on similar ideas, and that's Personified. This is a module we've developed at Morphed. Uh, Personified takes a very similar approach. We're using the local state, local storage, 
And in this case, we're going into that and pulling out a value. And we're going to use that value as a parameter on an endpoint. So you could imagine you could set up a view that's serving JSON and that view takes a parameter where we're able to use the local state and uh, basically customize the result set uh, that's coming back. What's coming back? We're getting JSON back. And that JSON can then be transformed with another module we've written called JSON template. And JSON template is able to use something like handlebars to transform that JSON into HTML, which is put on the page. So if we have a look at um, what uh, a personified block uh, looks like, you can see here we've got uh, a screen where we're trying to get back some seasonal, a seasonal promotional um, block. So you can see we've got the endpoint there, data promotion. That's just a view serving JSON. We have a template that's called the promotional hero template. This is JSON templates uh, exposing uh, a number of different templates. And the, the editor here has picked that they want to display a hero. And you can see here we've got parameters. So you, you can pull your parameters out from a few different places. It may be a cookie or your local storage. So you can see we're pulling out the season and uh, we're going to be sending that through as an attribute value. Um, and if, if there's not, nothing defined there, we're going to set a default value. That's also important just to make sure you're going to get some data back um, if, if there's nothing in uh, local storage. So yeah, the personified data is, uh, is, is very flexible. And basically, we're utilizing client state and the power of views to pull back uh, different content. We have JSON templates uh, as well, and I've just mentioned that. That's what Personified is using. Uh, JSON uh, template uh, transform JSON client side, um, and it's been designed with a plugin um, architecture. Um, and we have a transformer for handlebars, but you could easily implement other transformers if you wanted to. Uh, it's used in a couple of places uh, in this presentation. We're going to be using it for Sajari and Recombi as well as with personified. Now, when we designed JSON template, we wanted to do two things. We wanted to make sure it's going to be theme friendly. So that means that themers can define the handlebar templates, drop them into their theme, and they're discoverable in there because they're um, plugins. So we really try to make it easy for themers to um, define templates that are going to fit in with whatever you know, component library they're using. We also wanted it to be editor friendly. So you saw there, the editors could just pick out, pick out a nice, um, a nice sort of template for them to use. So yeah, um, basically, JSON template is a, a key part of the the puzzle here. Uh, another really key part is the logic that's going to be driving this. So as I've mentioned a couple of times, we're using local storage a lot to configure the personalization, uh, and so basically, you have to get data into local storage somehow. And that means you're going to have to have some client side logic there in JavaScript that's going to sort of work out what the user has been doing and write, the, write that information in. So that's that's a, a key thing that you can um, write to adapt to your own uh, business requirements. OK, so um, that's an overview of the Drupal modules. We will be getting into a, a demonstration. And for this, I've chosen uh, the, the subject domain of a bookshop. Um, bookshops are, are quite a, a nice uh, sort of domain because um, we have books and they can be classified or, or categorized a number of ways. So here we've just got a really simple schema where a book can have uh, topics, audiences, or a person uh, as an author. Um, we'll be really concentrating on topic and audience here because um, these are the, the two things that we'll be using to drive the personalization. Um, we do have a, a, a demo site here as well, and I've put the links uh, for this into the uh, discussion forum if you'd like to, uh, to have a look at those. Uh, I encourage you to, to click on and just, um, just have a click around and, and see what happens. On this screen here, we've, we've basically got two different um, states. The, the, the first time someone comes to the site and what the site looks like after someone's been there, you know, quite a number of times, around a 1,000 times. Um, you will notice that uh, each part of the, even though the pages look the same or similar, they actually have different content. So what you are seeing here is a home page that is 100% um, personalized. 
the, from the heroes to the blocks, the recommendations, to even some of the widgets in the footer, um, they're all personalized. And, and that was a design goal here is how can I design a home page that's 100% uh, personalized? I'm just going to um, tab across here into um, uh, the, the demo here. So this is, uh, this is the site after I've been to it a thousand times. And if you look down the, the bottom here, we've just got some information that's been echoed out um, just so you can have an understanding as to what's going on. So this is the behind the scenes. So you can see the site knows I've been here a thousand and twenty nine times. Um, my experience level is high. That's because I've been here quite a few times. Um, I'm currently in Australia. Um, the daytime is, well, it's more, that's not true. I should ref, I'm going to refresh that. Daytime is afternoon. Um, the season is winter. And uh, my favorite topic is sci-fi. And uh, I'm also interested in the adult uh, audience. So all of this information has been derived from um, things I've been doing um, on the site. And we'll get into the details of how that has been done soon. If I come across to um, a, an incognito tab here, you can see this is the first time I've come to the uh, to the site, and it's a lot less personalized. I, it doesn't really know too much about me at this point in time. So I've only been to the site once. I've really got no experience, and uh, I really should refresh that again. The daytime is going to be uh, the afternoon. And because I've refreshed that now, it, it knows where my GOIP is, and it's actually worked out. I'm, I'm in Australia, and it's winter. So you can see it's adapting uh, as I go. So hopefully you can see that, yeah, there's just information being gathered as I go, and basically all of that has been stored into local storage. I'm going to come back into um, the page here where I've, I've been here a number of times, and we're just going to have a look at how some of these blocks are being um, done. So this first block here is based on the number of times I've been to the site. So I've got high experience and it's pulling in a personalized, personified data block. So this is the view, it's pulling out a promotional hero and it's displaying that. Um, these blocks down here are driven by my favorite uh, topic and audience. So it knows I'm into sci-fi. So it's gonna say, hey, do you like Star Wars or Star Trek? Um, and this, once again, is a personified uh, data block where we're doing a view and pulling out that promotion. This one over here is based on um, the fact that I like the, uh, I have an affinity for the adult uh, audience. Um, the next block down here is quite interesting. This is a Recombi block. So Recombi is a third party uh, recommender as a service. Um, and basically it is able to track the clicks I do on the site, as well as the track, the clicks that everyone else does. It's like the wisdom of the crowd. So they're able to use a combination of algorithms to come up with recommendations that are going to suit me. And so these recommendations you see here are just for me based on the 1000 clicks I've done across the site. So for example, if, if I click on Lord of the Rings and I uh, look at that book, and then I come back to, to the homepage, you will see that Lord of the Rings has now disappeared from this uh, recommendations uh, list. And that's because Recombi knows I've already seen that content. And so it's going to remove that. Recombi is awesome for when you have a large corpus of material and you don't necessarily know the paths that people are going to take uh, through your uh, website. Um, coming down to the, the bottom, we've, we've actually got some uh, interesting things going on here uh, as well. Firstly, um, I'm just going to simulate coming in from an EDM. You can see up here in the, the top, I've got the UTM source of EDM. And we're able to use that information to, pro to show another block here, the thanks for being a subscriber block. Um, this block is done by smart content. So we're basically saying if the user has the, uh, the EDM uh, UTM tag, um, show this particular block. And in a similar way, we can simulate a, um, a click on an ad, for example. So up here, we've got the UTM source is ad. And we can see we've got a little block down here just saying, hey, we know books. So the user may have an intent to come in for a specific ad, but you know why not show them some more general content so that they can feel comfortable with uh, your offering? 
Uh, another th thing we've got here is this little newsletter sign up uh, form down here. If, if I click on sign up, I'm going to simulate that I've signed up to uh, a newsletter. I've come back to the uh, to the thanks for subscribing page. And you can see I've got a little goal up here called the subscribe uh, goal. So that's a, a parameter that's come uh, come through in the query string. And if we come down the bottom now, you can see that the, uh, the, the sign up uh, form has disappeared. And that's because the site knows that um, I've already signed up. Why should I be annoying people with a sign up block? So this is another example how smart content is able to um, sort of drive off that local storage and decide uh, what blocks to uh, to show. So yeah, I've I've shown you uh, a few different um, different techniques there. Not not all of them, but um, a number, and hopefully that will give you uh, a good good understanding of um, just uh, some of the things that are, that's possible. So moving along, we're just going to get into the 13 uh, techniques now. That's the name of the presentation uh, after all. And here they are, spoiler alert. We've got 13 of them. The 14th one down there, third-party profile, we are not using third-party data um, for this presentation. All of the uh, things you'll see are going to be um, based off um, uh, information that you've gathered from the client on your website. So the first one is uh, explicit opt-in. Uh, and this is where just a user interacts directly with uh, you know, some content on your site, such as clicking a link. Um, and classic cases of this are, are you know, I am a, I want to, you know, I'm interested in, all of these kinds of questions. They're quite common UX patterns. Um, when, you, when the user clicks on that, really you should be saving that information into local storage and using that to um, provide context. So this is uh, probably the most straightforward way that you can gather uh, information from your users and, and make the most of it. Uh, the second one is uh, recommendations. Uh, you saw how Recombi was basically providing a list of uh, recommendations just for me based on what I have done and what other people have done. Um, this probably is the most powerful thing um, I'm be showing today. Um, there's a lot of smarts uh, behind the system that's driving that. Um, we've also built uh, modules for search API integration, and that basically allows your Drupal site to tell Recombi a little bit more about the content. So it's able to do recommendations based on item similarity, as well as the, the click patterns of um, the users. Um, and as I said here, the, the um, the pros of this uh, is that it's very scalable um, and it's able to show uh, content that you may not even know is relevant, right? Users may be taking paths through your site that you, you are not aware of. So you don't need the editors to be expert in everything. This is basically uncovering uh, you know, interesting insights and, and bringing them up uh, to, the, to your users. Uh, Sajari search number three. I haven't demonstrated uh, Sajari, but it's it's definitely worth mentioning. Uh, Sajari is another SaaS offering which uh, provides search results. And what Sajari will do is it will track the user clicks on the actual result items, and it will use that information to um, promote the results that are clicked. So you can think of a click as a, as a positive upvote. And so what you're getting um, then is sort of search results that are optimize according to um, you know, the wisdom of the crowd or what people uh, like to do. Sajari also has some other advanced techniques where you're able to send context through for a user um, so that their search can also be um, sort of boosted or altered depending on what their uh, preferences are. Uh, the fourth one, uh, campaigns. Now, you know, the personalization efforts are, are often going to be driven by the marketing department, I would say, because they would like to communicate in the most direct uh, manner uh, with the users. So if someone has, you know, clicked on a, a campaign and coming through to the site, that is really important because the user has clear intent at that particular point in time. You know what they are interested in and you may as well collect that information. And we have found that if you time limit that, maybe to, you know, an hour or six hours, something like that, you're able to sort of keep that intent with that user for a, a sm small period of time, um, but not forever. 
Um, so that can be very handy for, you know, providing, you know, support information uh, for when that user comes through. And hopefully, you know, keep, keeping them on the site longer after they've read that initial bit of content. Uh, we have location as well. When a user comes to the site, they're going to have an IP address. It's possible to use uh, GeoIP lookup services that are able to do a best guess at uh, what country or city that person is in and also provide a lat long uh, geo coordinates. Uh, you saw um, after I refreshed the page there, it worked out I was in uh, Australia. Now, um, this data is always not going to be 100% uh, reliable because uh, you, you don't quite know um, how an IP might resolve. Um, but nonetheless, it, it is a really good way uh, to personalize if you want to uh, sort of localize the content you're serving. Um, a really cute offshoot of that is once you have the, the geo coordinates of someone, you're able to work out what hemisphere they're in, and then you're able to work out what month of the year it is, and then you can work out what season it is. So that was just a fun little thing we were able to do where you saw it could work out I was in winter based on my uh, coordinates. So this could be really handy if you're you know, running a shop that serves, you know, sells content for or different products for the, for the season, for example. Uh, the time of day, um, using JavaScript in the browser, you're able to work out what uh, the, the local time is for the user. And this can be then be mapped through to, is it, you know, daytime or the afternoon or evening, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and once again, this can be, you know, helpful if, if your um, website uh, is in need of that kind of thing. Uh, the number of visits is, a, is another um, really sort of simple and obvious one. And I would say this is probably where the easiest way you can get started is just every page view, you can increment a counter to see how many times uh, a user has been to the site. So you can find out if they're a total noob or if they're, uh, you know, have got a really strong affinity with your website and uh, your organization. Um, I call it a blunt instrument down there in the cons. I think, uh, you know, it's great knowing how many times someone has been to the site, but you don't actually really know what stage of the journey they're at. Um, so, you know, people may go through your site quite quickly or some may take years to, uh, to finally get to the, the end point. Um, but nonetheless, it does give you quite a good, um, a, a good signal, especially around welcoming people into the site and helping them get set up with, uh, you know, the initial content you may want them to, to read. Uh, affinity, I, I love this one. Uh, this is one of the, the main things I wanted to solve with uh, when we were started out with the, the personalization side of things. Uh, affinity is really um, how much attractiveness someone has for certain subject um, matter. So you saw that we've got topics and um, audiences and each bit of content is marked up with that. Once that, uh, that structure is echoed out into metadata, we're able to use that metadata to keep a track of the kinds of things the user is interested in. So for example, um, you know, if I was to go to the, the Harry Potter page, it would know I'd be interested in certain kinds of things and that can just increment a little counter. And then once you know that, you can derive some summary statistics from that and work out what your favorite topic or audience is. Um, and then, of course, you can use that to, to drive those blocks. The really cool thing about this is that the user doesn't have to explicitly opt into saying, you know, I'm interested in sci-fi. You can basically derive that as they're, as they're going around. Um, this is really um, simple. I think if, if you were to look at it, you may say it's a little bit naive because you're just doing counts. It's by no means as sophisticated as something such as Recombi. But it does give you a very clear signal as to, um, you know, which segment a user might uh, fit into. Uh, we have goals as well. Uh, you saw, um, you know, when the user uh, came back from uh, signing up uh, to a newsletter, we're able to, to capture the end of that journey and store that away. And that's, uh, you know, just a, a really simple way to, uh, you know, build adaptive interfaces for example, or maybe, you know, serve the, the user the next step after they have uh, achieved that goal. So this is a pretty simple way to, uh, to you know, organize a, a staged kind of progression through your website. 10 minutes to go. Okay. Um, profile sync. So we've got the, um, it's possible to sync up with third party uh, services as well. Um, this is a more, uh, 
sort of tight integration, you could say, uh, which will require um, you to uh, write some more custom code to pull that profile down. But the benefit of this approach is that we're using, um, uh, we're able to speak to your users in the most direct uh, way and use the tagging or whatever in your CRM uh, system. It's also possible to uh, use uh, the device and the user agent string to work out if something is mobile or desktop. That can be helpful if you want to serve um, clients to, to users on the go and maybe um, you know bias it towards showing some more sort of location-based uh, content. Uh, dark mode, this is a, an interesting little one. You, not everything has to be done with JavaScript. I just threw this in because it's great to try to think about this problem in as broad terms as possible. What can we derive from uh, the current uh, user context? And so if, if a user wants um, to have a dark mode, um, why not display it to them in the theme? And finally, third-party data. So none of the stuff we're using here is pulling in third-party profiles uh, from anywhere else. It's really been about deriving information from the users uh, when they're on your uh, website and making the most of that. I've also got to say that the, the emphasis of today's presentation has been about serving better content and ex improving the user experience. So when you hear personalization, don't necessarily think, you know, nasty ads and, you know, privacy breaches. You can think of it as just a better way to improve the user experience. Uh, there are all the links. Um, I've provided those uh, in the chat there. Um, so please f feel free to have a look at those. Okay, and just sort of wrapping up now, um, I really want to emphasize that Drupal has a bright future for the next phase of the web. Um, I think Drupal has just got, you know, an awesome foundation there and things such as uh, JSON API and the integrations we're able to do with it will allow us to, to take it to uh, the next level. And, you know, personalization and customization of content is just uh, one part of that. Um, what we have tried to do at Morphed is release uh, a number of modules there that the rest of the Drupal community uh, can use. And uh, I really hope I've given you some uh, practical uh, tips and guidance there as how you can get started with your personalization journey. So yeah, thank you very much. If you're you know interested, uh, feel free to, to hit me up and I'm, I'm more than happy to chat about these things. And I think that gives us some times for questions now. Thank you. All right, that was awesome, Murray. Uh, great presentation and uh, yeah, super interesting. Um, before we, uh, yeah, feel free to ask any questions and I'll sort of go in order and, uh, pose them to Murray. Um, but maybe I just wanted to start off, uh, like the, I had sort of made a mental note about the seasonal aspect of personalization. Um, me being in the middle of, uh, you know, 35 degree summer currently and, uh, like the immediate kind of potential that a customer could grasp like how do you do you have any thoughts on demonstrating the overall value of personalization for, especially for those who think that like your last item the third party data is personalization like how do you how do you recommend presenting it to to customers and clients yeah i think it's it's going to come down a lot to yeah the the the, the individual customer or client what their use cases um, are. I've, I've tended to show um, a content sort of focused approach here uh, today where um, yeah, we're, we're sort of trying to optimize the content that we're serving. Certainly there are use cases there for e-commerce as well. And a lot of the techniques we've shown there could equally uh, you know, apply to, uh, to that domain as well. So I, I think in different domains, you're going to have different ways of demonstrating the value. I think in you know, e-commerce, obviously that's easier to to measure um, on um, you know, more content-based sites, it may be harder to, to measure that in, in many cases because you don't really quite know uh, how well users are going there. But you know, in terms of um, you know, engagement from users and you know, sign-ups and, and those kinds of things or whatever the, the journey is, I think that they're, they're gonna be the metrics that drive um, your success and that will depend on, on the use case. Right, and I think maybe overall there's kind of a you know, 
maybe maybe the client isn't thinking about dark mode versus light mode, but there is a case to be made about just having a 5% more comfortable experience overall. And these are the little tweaks that contribute to that. That's right. I mean, when I sat down to write this, I really just wanted to try to come up with anything that I could there. So I was going for the big ones and the small ones there. So, uh, but you know, it's good to try to so apply everything you can. Yeah. 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 So I have a question from um, Joshua. Uh, is it possible to reliably sync a CRM if the user is not authenticated? And is there any value pushing anonymous uh, anonymous user data to a CRM? Yeah, they, uh, well, yeah, everyone says great question, but I, I think they're really pertinent uh, issues there. I, I personally would not really want to push data to a CRM. I don't think it's safe enough to, to have a, a, like a weak identifier on a website and then use that to reliably push data into the CRM. I mean, you could try that. I don't really think you could rely on it from a security point of view. I think if you are um, syncing stuff from CRM or uh, a marketing system, you can, uh, you know, get an identifier um, coming through, and um, you can then pull out information in a secure way via a client side, sorry, a server side script. I think so long as the data you're then presenting is not personal, um, then that would be okay. So I'd be thinking you could pull back different tags out of a CRM or, or marketing system. You know, like this is a hot prospect. I think that that kind of information would be totally fine to to pull that out. You're, you're not leaking any personal information, but definitely because you've got anonymous users, those um, security aspects are, are vital to consider. Gotcha. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Um, we have two minutes to go. If you have any questions, throw something in there uh, really quickly, and I'll I'll stop talking and jump right to it. Um, the other thing that I wanted to kind of one thing that I've gathered is that um, the implementation is one aspect of doing it, but really it's the ongoing iteration and experimentation. Uh, do you have any um, thoughts about uh, how how to go about experimenting and and like are any of the things that you talked about sort of iterative, iterable, improvable, um, but you know still kind of manageable algorithms for maybe a team that doesn't have a data scientist on board. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, yeah. So first off, Sajari and Rakombi will will take a, care of a lot of that sort of hard thinking. If if you know if that's what you're thinking about. But what I didn't really get to show uh, here was just the the way the editors would write those promotional blocks. So we, we do have that concept of the promo block, and editors are easily able to go in and create those and then assign them to different. Um, different tags, if, if you will. So the whole editing interface for editors is very important. So that will allow them to to uh, to easily experiment with that. So if you had a new sci-fi pr promo block, you could create that and the view should just be pulling the most recent one off there. So you're kind of using the same content management tools that Drupal editors are used to. Um, and then that's the way they, they uh, interrelate with the system. I, I probably wouldn't want them going into smart content and doing if then else things. That's why I've really gone across to try to use views with personified because that's falling into much more of a content editor workflow of, of just managing content. Cool. Um, the last question kind of uh, ad addresses that point. Like what's, what's the balance um, with too much personalization, like very narrow content topics um, or the risk of just getting the same content. Yeah, well, that that's yeah, that's right. I think you you probably got to have a, a mix of things. I okay, we just got one minute, but yes, it's you know it's it's a fine balance, and that's up to you to um you know to balance that out. I would I, I think would say, conversions yeah, or whatever yeah, matter you know yeah, whatever you're tracking you yeah. you test and mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. If it gets better, then more. If it gets worse, less. <laughs> that was the answer you were looking for, Scott. I should have just said that one. <laughs> hey, guys, we've got 30 seconds. But I'd just like to say thanks a lot for everyone Yeah, coming along today. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out if you, you have any other questions there. And thank you, Scott, for, for moderating. Appreciate it. Yeah, that. good to see you all, Mary. See ya. <laughs>